Hello, Rohit Marani here from Office Hours. We've effectively uh, built out a platform to help out individuals think through next steps beyond, of course, traditional finance. Call it a good amount of like banking to buy side. Very excited to have Leuna on board with us today to speak a little bit more about her experience. And then, of course, just getting a better understanding, of course, whether it be on the banking side of things, private equity, definitely want to tap into, of course, London experience as a whole, as well as, of course, getting an understanding of how business school is going. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Maybe we can get away or get into a little bit on the um, the intro side of things on your end. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Leuna. I, I was born in Austria, grew up primarily in the U.S., went to UT Austin for, for my undergrad, where I majored in finance. I started my career in investment banking, initially working in the Houston-based oil and gas group at Credit Suisse. Spent about one year with that team before I moved to London and joined the consumer and retail group where I worked for about a year and a half. From there, I joined a family office private equity firm called Man Capital and did a lot of investing in uh, the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, which, which was really exciting. Spent about three years there, moved on to Carlisle's uh, opportunistic credit team and started at HBS last year where I'm now in my second year. Thank you for that. So many questions, but I guess we can start off with, did you think from the point at UT Austin to where you are today that the path was going to look like that? Was some of it planned out? Was it a bit more opportunistic as you got into it? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, no, it wasn't planned out at all. I started at UT actually wanting to be a lawyer. I was in international right. relations major my first year, had no idea what business or finance was and transferred into the business school as a sophomore and really just randomly went down uh, pursuing investment banking. From that point onward, I would say it was a bit more planned out in that I, I knew I wanted to leave Houston. I never thought I'd be in London for seven years. And after, as, when I joined banking, I, I knew I wanted to move into private equity, but I didn't think I'd be doing emerging markets or or end up at HBS six years later. Wow, love it. It was the, and in all honesty, so thank you so much for the articles that you've written for anyone in the attendees that hasn't read some of our blog articles, just get officehours.com slash blog. We're very lucky to have Leona write some of those for us. I and mean, I think it definitely parallels quite a bit to, of course, not only your experience, but in all honesty, how many mentees and how many juniors think about things. So if we get into that a little bit, oil and gas, we tend to find that, of course, that it parallels into generalist experience, yet at the same time, of course, if you want to get into climate, it, if you want to get into almost like call like double impact type of energy transition type stuff, can you speak a little bit more about that? And then of course, was it a bit more opportunistic, like, you know, pursuing oil and gas and then get into getting into, of course, emerging markets thereafter? Yeah. So I, I guess I'll premise this by saying this was in 2015, 2014. So, uh, you know, nine years ago now, oil and gas, I think was, was a much different, different world. And I, I did primarily exploration and production with which was actually not like traditional banking at, at all. Very different sort of modeling. It was very niche in a lot of ways. I went into it mostly because my parents both worked in, in oil and um, going to UT awesome. and growing up in Houston. I think especially back then most of the firms that that recruited at UT were were the Houston offices. So mm -hmm. it was more so kind of just like a natural progression of where I was rather than like a innate interest in, in oil and right. gas. I don't think there was a ton of like emphasis back then on like ESG or climate or any of the mm -hmm. stuff that, it, that I think is probably pretty paramount in the field right now. And I learned very, very quickly that I was not passionate about the sector. Definitely not enough to want to dedicate my career to oil and gas, which is why I transferred out after less than a year. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. What sort of advice would you give to someone? And in all honesty, I just had a conversation like this with an individual out of a boutique down in Houston thinking through, do I want to stay in oil and gas? It was kind of like reputation of the firm that attracted them in the first place. And then of course, they're thinking about like how to position literally exactly this to consumer or tech. What sort of advice would you give to someone as they kind of think about that transition? Because I feel like, of course, sometimes we do mention, you know, staying within an organization, staying within a specific realm, because it's like, give it a chance. But at the same time, if you don't 
or if you know you want to do something different, when do you kind of like reach that point of like, all right, I'm just going to opt out and double down on what I really want to do? Yeah, I, mean, I think you should always go after what you really want to do. And of course, that that changes. I didn't actually go after what I really wanted to do coming out of college. I went after trying to get a banking job and trying to get a banking job at one of the top banks in, in oil and gas. And CS had always been at top three. That's why I ended up working there. But I do think it pigeonholes you, especially ENP because again it's it's such a different sort of like valuation analysis that you do and I had friends who worked in the industry for a couple of years and found it hard to transition into like a non-energy related private equity role a lot of them got into infra and then maybe from there moved into something more traditional a lot of them also went to business school to make the pivot but I think going wow. from oil and gas to something like very traditional like consumer and retail or generalist at least back then again I it was rare. So if someone genuinely has a passion for it, then of course, specializing early can be helpful. But if the passion isn't there, then it might be harder to make that move later. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And this might be a little bit more like a general question as a whole. But even actually this individual that I was connecting with, she had some trouble just thinking about like what she's really she knew what she was passionate about, but she didn't necessarily know like how that conveys into work and kind of like a professional atmosphere. Any sort of advice that you give to juniors as they think about like what really drives them, what they're really passionate about, how to find that within the workplace or how to find it outside and then potentially merge them both in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think a lot of people have had difficulty with answering that question and ends up in a situation where people are almost paralyzed and, and don't make decisions because they don't know what they're calling and life is. But, you know, I think in all honesty, I don't know many like 18, 19, 21 year olds that know they're calling in life. And if you do, that's very likely to change. So I think my best advice would be don't stress about it. I think pursuing something that is broad or opportunistic and keeps the most doors open is is generally a safe strategy when you're younger and your passions will, they're, they're derived from your experiences, right? So I think as you try out a lot of of things, then you'll be able to hone in on that a, a lot more as you get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes sense. How often do individuals think through a course kind of like, well, effectively, the bulge bracket experience that you've had thus far, and feel free, of course, you can make this a little bit more conversational as a whole to where you went for your first buy side role, and kind of what that looked like, because tell us a little bit more about that, if you don't mind me asking, and of course, kind of like the environment there, because of course, I guess what I'm getting at is that like, when you're at a very reputable bulge bracket, and then of course not like take a chance at a newer type of shop or a newer type of fund but there is an element of risk there right yeah for sure i think early on in your career there probably is an element of, of risk in, in a lot of the decisions that you make the way i thought about it, it it was opportunistic i wasn't going after a family office or emerging markets specifically i um knew i wanted to move into the buy side and that role at man capital um, a headhunter approached me with it and there were aspects about it that I felt like played on my strengths. So um, I've had a really international upbringing. I'm Iranian by descent. I was born in Austria, lived in Canada, the US. My parents yeah. lived in Europe, a lot of my upbringing. So I've always liked traveling and I'm experiencing different cultures. And the fact that a big facet of that job was investing in, in emerging markets and it also had an element of investing in the US, I felt like that really played on kind of my background. So that was one reason I pursued it. And I just found that exciting as well, like the opportunity to travel to, to different places and invest in, in different markets. I liked that it was very agnostic. It wasn't a traditional buyout firm. We did a lot of like JVs. We did a lot of buy and build strategies. So I thought it would give me like a pretty broad investing experience. And I also really liked the team. And I, I think that was ultimately what gave me comfort in, in the decision. There were definitely moments where, you know, I wondered if I had made the wrong the the right or the wrong choice. But I think all in all, it was it was a really unique experience that actually helped position me in ways that I wouldn't have necessarily expected at that time. Mm -hmm. No, I think that says a lot, of course, because at the end of the day, one, I believe, and we spoke about this too, right? Like too young to effectively do something that you're not really passionate about, too young to get into something just for the sole sake of getting into something. And uh, I mean, jokes aside, right? You could be like, listen, I'm in it for the money. Today, if you put the money in the market, like everything is down, <laughs> like uh, abysmally. So all of a sudden, done, the money could be there one day and then it's not, right? Like you really focus on what you're passionate about and drive that forward. Can you tell us a little bit more for what you're able to speak about, of course, like investing in the 
emerging markets, what that looks like, how that's maybe changed since, of course, when you did it to where it is today. Would you advise individuals getting into it? How does it differ from working at a, this is a broader basis question, right? But of course, how does it differ from working at a larger buyout shop in the States and of course, developed economy versus developing? Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's very, very different. I, a I think, large question. <laughs> I think, I guess if you think about kind of like the macro environment, especially investing in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a lot of where we invested in, you've obviously got a very, very large population that is growing pretty significantly. And, and that growth is really being driven by a lot of like sustainable factors such as mm -hmm. demographics, increases in consumer spending, et cetera. So it's very attractive in terms of the opportunity. And, and there's a ton of demand, right, uh, for private capital, especially. So I, I think that, that aspect of it is pretty exciting. What is very different is that there are not a ton of assets of, of scale with sophisticated business practices and management teams and the few that do exist get bid up to crazy multiples. So the way you pursue investment opportunities there is very different than, than the way you would in developed markets. Developed markets, most deals are, are banked and they're pretty standard processes. I think in, in emerging markets, or we did a lot of work in Nigeria and Kenya specifically. It would be a lot more of like a thematic approach where we would find an industry that, that we liked. We felt like there was demand there. And then we would do sort of like a competitive landscape, look for the opportunities that existed in that subsector. And we'd either partner up with a management team or purchase like anything that there was of scale there. But the majority of the investment thesis was often like a buy and build de novo brownfield style strategy. And that what that means is that your your job becomes a lot more operational. And I think some people love that some people don't. But I spent a lot of time actually on the ground in, in Nigeria helping build wow. out this diagnostics business. So yeah, I think those are the main differences. And then of course, the risk profile is, is very different because you're investing in a different currency, you have inflation, you have geopolitical risks. Uh, but yeah, I think the day to day is, is pretty different from traditional PE. Wow. How was I guess that really takes it to another level on the operational side of things and kind of like boots on the ground. How is that side of things? If you don't mind me asking, especially yeah. in an area potentially that you're not too, too familiar with, right? Yeah. I mean, I loved it personally. I thought it was really, really exciting. And I think being part of like helping grow the business and then really seeing it from the ground up, uh, it gets you like very passionate about what you're doing. And especially most of the projects I did were were in healthcare. And it, that was actually kind of the, the facet that got me really, really excited for like healthcare investing, which is, which is mm -hmm. what I've been trying to pursue ever since. But I think it's exciting, but it's a ton of work, especially just like building out the management team, sitting out with like every single function and, and trying to, you know, build out HR, trying to build out like a marketing plan. That stuff was all very, very new to me. So I think it was a great experience, but, you know, I ultimately also did decide that it was too operational for what I wanted to do. Really? Like I viewed myself as an investor and not so much as an operator, at least in the long term. Term, which is which is why I ultimately moved out of emerging market. Fair. Do you think, feel free to pass any of these questions, of course, as we get into it. Do you think operationally focused PE shops are all what they kind of like live up to be? I've seen even like some like, not even sort of like Mimi jokey style, but is effectively like you're just going to be doing more work, whether it be on like the consulting side, the add-on side, like really getting involved rather than of course taking on external resources. Whereas at the same time, like many individuals will like really kind of like focus on like, you know, I want to get my hands dirty. I really want to get that operation focused experience, but then you play investor, then you also play like obviously kind of like board members, observers, and potentially like FP&A, Corp Dev. I mean, there's so many different roles that go with it, right? Yeah. I mean, I think there's definitely like a middle ground sweet mm -hmm. spot. I think the way like the private equity environment is, is heading in the sense that it's a lot more competitive. There's a ton of dry powder. Multiples are, you know, being bid up to all time highs. And now we're in an environment where it's, it's difficult to get financing as well. It becomes a lot more important to actually be able to to pull on those growth levers, which is the operational side to, to really add value mm -hmm. rather than like depending on what is, I guess, traditional PE, which is just mm -hmm. leverage and cost cutting. Like that doesn't really work. So I think the truly, really good private equity firms, at least in my opinion, that I see do a lot of the operational stuff and they do that really well. But, you know, with that said, you're the investor, you're not the management team. So 
So I yeah. think that's why it's like very key to partner up with a great management team and you'll help with like the strategy and potentially with some bolt-on acquisitions. But I don't think ideally you want to be the one doing it just because that's not the best use of, of your resources as an investor. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Especially as you kind of think through what it is that entices you and interests you, right? Yeah. Do you think that it all has kind of come to like some sort of like culmination in a way where it was like, okay, oil and gas, maybe interesting, maybe not as interesting for me, but let's go consumer. And then let's try like consumer banking and then buy side. And then you mentioned healthcare, right? Yeah. A bit more around, of course, like culmination of like thoughts around like, you know, like different experiences to figure out what you really want to do. And then do you think that comes to a culmination? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but around like business school as well? Yeah, no, for sure. I think, you know, initially it was a lot of kind of push factors. Like I tried something out and decided that there was a lot that I gained from it, but it wasn't where I saw myself in maybe like five or 10 years. So left oil and gas for that reason, left Houston and then London working in consumer. I really loved consumer, found it a super interesting industry. And actually probably until uh, less than a year ago, I, I thought I would do something in the consumer space. And at that point, maybe became more pool factors. I think when I got the uh, job at Man Capital and and I was exposed to the healthcare world that uh, just, I guess that's where it sounds cheesy to say, but I started to find my passion and especially just like being on the ground there, right? And seeing how much of a need there was for preventative care and just like the lack of resources. So I got involved with a lot of stuff on the, the nonprofit side within healthcare. I have um, been sitting on a, the board of a mental health, the Nigerian mental health charity for about three and a half years now still involved yeah still involved um mm-hmm. and that was all because of working in nigeria i i got mm-hmm. interested in the space i also did some consulting for an hiv charity in, in the uk so initially it was like a lot of personal interest and when i applied for for business school i kind of thought maybe i'll i'll want to like pursue this healthcare thing more but i didn't really think i had the background for it because a lot of people mm-hmm. who work in healthcare investing come from and you know phds yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Either like more technical background, or at least they did like healthcare banking. I had mm. done like one and a half deals in healthcare, and I was interested in it. That was kind of yeah. it. But in this last like year, I think that interest has, has really grown. And I think, you know, if I specialize at some point in my career, I think that probably makes sense as a logical next step. Mm-hmm. I love it. So that ends up being we think about it, right? Like from a transition perspective, if we're going to go like generalist oil and gas to consumer to healthcare, and it's arguably like call it because I graduated technically 2014 as well six seven eight years out of school right to like really figure out which I think is phenomenal because too many people arguably put pressure on themselves way too early around what they need to figure out and then they're like okay I'm like I think also like the world puts this like pressure and mentality around like getting pigeonholed within a certain sector which probably arguably isn't right right it's like all right if I want to stay in finance if I want to stay in banking buy side as a whole and so long you choose the right opportunities along the way correct me if I'm wrong but you can end up like moving right and like pivoting a little bit as you kind of like think through this and so long your story I and mean, that's honestly what we try to focus on quite a bit does your story kind of like tie out right it doesn't have to be necessarily x to y to z you can bounce around but still does the bouncing make sense yeah no i i totally agree i mean like some of the best advice i was given like years ago was um you know start broad and then specialize as as you become more senior in your career and i think that's what i tried to do oil and gas obviously Obviously, it was pretty niche, but then with like consumer and and having kind of an agnostic strategy that gave me the opportunity to try out a bunch of different things and do a lot of exploration because again, like how are you supposed to know if you're 21 years old right out of college? And I think like, yeah, if you do think, you know, be open-minded to the fact that that might change. Even starting at HBS a year ago, I thought I was like 120% sure about exactly what I wanted. And in this last year, yeah, that's changed so much. Much, but I think that that was like difficult for me at first because I, I was like, why am I bouncing around so much? But I think yeah. it actually shows like personal growth because if you go into things 
and nothing ever changes, then you probably haven't really grown much, much as a person. That's huge. Honestly, we'll probably take that snippet and put it on our Instagram uh, for what it's worth. Being at HBS, how often have you come across individuals that knew exactly what they wanted to get into and they just wanted a break in life or a pause? And then on the other side of it, how often you come across individuals that really still kind of like didn't know or they were kind of like maturing through the process, thinking through different industries? Do you see both? Yeah, I think you see both, but I, I would say probably more of the latter. You'd be surprised at how many people, uh, like even, you know, ECs uh, don't know what they want to do or they're unsure. Oh, there's, meaning, sorry? Sorry, EC meaning? Oh, that's what we call our second years. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think a lot of people are still kind of experimenting, don't mm -hmm. know. There's like some statistic our career offices tell us, which is, I don't know the percentage, but it's like 80% of people or something like that change their job within one year post HBS. So yeah, I think probably, you know, we probably want to decide at some point, but I think I'm probably actually toward the side of like being more sure of, of what I want because a lot of people mm -hmm. are really just still trying things out. Yeah, nice. That's honestly kind of like a refreshing like breath of air, right? When you think about it, because otherwise there's too much pressure to really get an understanding of like what you want to get into, I feel like too early. As you think about it, what almost narrowed down the focus to healthcare on your end? Was it more the experience that came along the way, the general interest? I mean, the market dynamics, health Healthcare, I think is like one of the largest, if not the largest percentage of GDP. So of course, kind of like backing like macro conditions as well. But I guess, did you start ruling stuff out along the way? And you were like, okay, now I want to double down on healthcare? <laughs> no, it was not at all that system. It was literally, you know, when I think when I first got put on like my first healthcare deal, I was like, oh God, this is terrible. I don't want to do healthcare. I want to do like retail. But yeah, so I worked on that project in Nigeria. And like I said, I spent a lot of time on, on the ground working in it, like touring public hospitals hospitals and like, negotiating with with the government on some PPPs we were working on. And it was just it was really difficult to see like the environment there. And I think I think we all know that like these challenges exist in the world, but actually being there and seeing it, I spent so much time thinking like, how do you fix this? And you know, like, there's, I couldn't come up with an answer how I could fix it. But I started looking for ways that I could help make a difference. And that's how I found not nonprofit that I joined. And I think that interest just kind of grew from there. So it really was like a personal interest for a long time. And initially, it was more so like global health specifically, I hadn't lived in the US for almost seven years, right. And then I came back to the US last year. And I had like no idea how my insurance worked. Like I didn't get why I had to wait four months to get an appointment. So yeah, then yeah. I think that opened my eyes to like a lot of the problems in US health and just reading more about that doing more mm -hmm. work there. I just found that I was like always reading about it and listening to podcasts and wanting to talk to people. And now this year I'm taking two classes that are like healthcare specific, did a lot of healthcare work during my internship this past summer. So mm -hmm. at some point it was just like, the more you can integrate your passions and your interests with your day-to-day -day work, the more exciting life gets, right? So I, I think it just was a natural mm -hmm. thing that happened over time. Yeah, hundred percent, honestly. I wouldn't say that like, well, I wouldn't also not say, but the passion has been like very much so driven around like helping people, but it just kind of like came into this business at the same time. It wasn't necessarily like we were looking for a way to do that. However, we started office hours during the pandemic, right in the middle of a pandemic, where at the end of the day, like analysts were effectively confined to working from home. There wasn't so much the learning from osmosis, learning from MDs. You're in a group meeting with a general partner. Someone puts it on mute and discusses what they really want to learn. You couldn't really do that as much. So it really just came to came all together when it came around the whole fact that like during the pandemic, people weren't really learning things, office hours came about. And all of a sudden, of course, there's this great resignation. So people started looking for other jobs. Now, arguably, there are more layoffs happening at banks, unfortunately. So people will still be looking for roles as a whole. And then of course, buy side recruiting just continuously happens. As you've seen it, as I'm sure you saw it as a little bit on your end as well, going in for like VP positions, for what you're able to speak about, how crazy does buy side recruiting get? I know you've written some articles about it, which we definitely uh, genuinely, genuinely appreciate and it provides a lot of insight. But this stuff is definitely like, it even happened before Labor Day with a few firms for 2024 associates, right? Oh, right. Yeah, I think the associate recruiting is just like a whole other world. And yeah. I feel very sorry for people going through that because it's, uh, yeah, I, I heard as well and um, people getting, you know, interviewing while they're still in training, which personally, I don't really know if that's the best way to get great candidates to join your firm. But um, yeah. Yeah. that's just, yeah. But, you know, a lot of firms, I think, didn't, didn't even participate in, in 
that this year. But yeah, it's it's been absolutely insane on that level. I think VP recruiting is is not as crazy, it, at least like MBA level. It's not even, you know, it all happens at once. It's kind of over a couple of months. There's busier periods, obviously, but thankfully there's a bit more of like time to figure out what you want on the VP side. Totally. When you go in as a VP and I'm curious more on like the intern side of things, is it expected to just know more? And of course, just kind of like engage and interact with associates, not so much as if like you're their superior or manager, but there must be that element, right? Compared to like going in as like an intern, maybe for like a banking internship. Because correct me if I'm wrong, was that the last time you were technically like an intern? So when I was at Carlisle, I was a pre-MBA intern, but I was there for like eight months. So it, was, it wasn't really an internship style per se. But yeah, I guess before that, the last time would have been banking junior year of college. <laughs> right. And how does that, well, I mean, of course it differentiates in a variety of angles, but arguably that like intern title probably is the most senior for MBAs, right? I probably, I, I don't know about other industries, how they do it, but yeah. I'm sure it like differs firm by firm. So I can only speak to my experience, but I think my firm did like a very, good job of treating me like a full-time VP and that spoke volumes to me because they they trusted me to mm -hmm. to you know take as much responsibility as I could take and you know I traveled over the summer I, I did work with associates it was wow. as if I was a full-time uh VP so I don't think like the it's obviously an internship in the sense that like you need to prove yourself but it's not like the same as if a college internship where you're really trying to learn if, if you like the job yeah, I, I think it's a lot more of the fit. Yeah. yeah exactly makes sense we've got one question here before we get into that I had one question as well and then we can answer this other one how was your time in London London's actually like arguably like I would have been there like probably if I had like uh, COVID not happened but as you kind of think about it like between working in I look at it as very similar to in New York whether it be kind of like the subway system cosmopolitan melting pot melting pot call it what have you but just getting an understanding of time in London working there. I know bankers actually, I'm not going to say work-life balance is a bit more like a real thing there, but there is a reason that like 5 p.m. like bars would be flooded. Even on Fridays, it was like around <laughs> like full on like blue suits, like the same shade of blue would just be like flooding these pubs. But how was it kind of differentiated from working in the state since you got so many years of experience there? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love London as a city. Obviously, I spent you know, so much time there. I thought I was going to go for like a year or two and then I ended up getting my citizenship. So that was crazy. But yeah, I think it's it's a great place to to work and it's really exciting being able to do a lot of cross-border deals and interact with people from completely different cultures and different work environments. So that was super exciting for me. I don't think at least the bankers were out there at 5 p.m. That certainly wasn't the case. But yeah, I do remember Canary Wharf was always like flooded with, with people. I don't know who they are what they do. <laughs> I think uh, work-life balance honestly wasn't that different than the US. I think you get more vacation time and you're actually allowed to take it without people questioning you. I think you get like 25 days as an analyst. Wow. But otherwise, I would say like the days were pretty similar. So I, I would not recommend going to London in an effort to get uh, like an easier life. <laughs> right, right, right. No, it makes sense. I think it's just, it's different at the end of the day, if you want to like travel within Europe and have a more cosmopolitan approach and we can with some people that want to work EMEA as a whole and it's kind of like a first good step to make it back to Asia or just kind of like explore other opportunities. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the thing about the US, right? It's, it's always going to be very, very US centric. And, and when you're in London, I was shocked when I first joined Credit Suisse there that like no one was British. I thought everyone was going to be British. Yeah. But yeah, my team was like Italian and German and French and Spanish. Uh, there were very few British people. So yeah, it's, it's super cosmopolitan in that sense that's definitely like a big difference yeah makes sense if you don't mind we can get to this question basically just general insights on breaking into banking especially in an environment like right now where as unfortunate as it is we went from i remember if we're in 2022 right now technically and i get confused with how many like recruiting cycles happen 2021 last year and then 2020 the year before what i'm getting at is that like 2020 was covid so a lot of layoffs last year was technically like the great resignation we had individuals getting jobs 
jobs, like you could literally apply to a role and almost like get into a first round by 5 p.m. today. It was that competitive to <laughs> bodies in the door to really, banks were just like, we can't hire fast enough because the world was opening back up theoretically. Mm-hmm. So they really just needed basically like, they called it like butts in seats type of situation, just hiring people. And now, unfortunately as it is, of course, in 7A, volume is down. A lot of those individuals that frankly got involved in banking are being laid off. Really? Mm-hmm. Has done this thing. And I don't want to see, we posted about it a little bit and it's in the news too, where some like goose egg, like goose zero bonuses, right? Basically being like, listen, like if we need to lay someone off, then we have to pay severance. Whereas if you just get like a zero bonus, people will leave on their own accord and then you don't have to pay severance. It's right. it's, news. it's nothing like that we're like announcing ourselves. It's very unfortunate. But I guess what I'm getting at is that like now we're back into an environment where of course it's like arguably difficult if there are layoffs and hiring freezes. How do you recommend, what sort of advice would you give to the junior looking to break in from undergrad? Yeah, gosh, that's really tough. I think if you are a freshman or a sophomore and you know you see this environment in front of you and who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years, obviously you have the advantage of being able to position yourself as competitively as possible. So if that means like offering to intern for free, I don't know if people are still cold calling boutiques these days, but that's what I did to get my sophomore year internship. Whatever you can do to help you stand out because I, it sounds like it is probably going to be a bit of an uphill battle for the next couple of years. If you're a junior, then yeah, it's a tough environment. These things happen. I think definitely still try to apply to the bulge brackets or wherever you want to apply to, but it probably doesn't hurt to to hedge yourself and maybe also contact boutique banks and you know offer to, to intern there. I think the wider you cast your net, the better positioned you'll be and kind of goes back to our conversation earlier too. I, th- I think the most important thing is to like not stress because it's not the end all be all, right? I think people are aware of these economic cycles and you're not going to get like punished for not interning at Goldman Sachs your junior year. There's still going to be opportunities a couple of years from now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Honestly, a lot of what we recommend is definitely pushing that uh, cold outreach, getting in touch with as many people as possible. I know it's definitely like easier said than done. And as you kind of think about it, but a lot of what we recommend is like literally like having a list of like a hundred people to reach out to on a Sunday and then yeah. following up with that hundred and then adding another hundred. And before you know it, you start building out a pipeline in that manner. Some people are like, you know, like not many alum from my school, but it's like, okay, even if there are five alum that end up in finance, like become best friends with those five, right? Like do everything you can to get in touch with them and engage. Yeah, no, for sure. I completely agree. Especially if you're like a freshman or a sophomore, that's the best way to get, to get internships and to kind of build up a resume. So, so you can be competitive when it comes to like junior summer or senior year recruiting cold calling and cold emailing does work. Uh, that's how I got both my first two internships. So yeah, that's, that's good advice. I think also just kind of thinking about what industries are maybe benefiting from this environment. So, you know, I'm sure like restructuring firms or different types of, of investing roles probably are, are hiring. There are industries that do better in downturns. So kind of trying to be strategic and in that angle and maybe like putting a bit more weight to those sorts of opportunities. And then also thinking ahead to like, you know, maybe you want to be in banking this year, but where do you want to be in five years? If you ultimately want to be an investor in business development or whatnot, there are also other jobs that that can get you there. So just casting your net out pretty wide. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. What other roles, if not banking, are you thinking more on like the corporate finance side of things, like not so much trading, but in general, then one might think to target? I mean, I guess uh, consulting is (laughs) is an option. I I think uh, if you want to work in like an investing role in the future, especially a a lot of people work in in consulting and then move into that. It really just depends on what you want to do, right? I think trading is, uh, my brother works trading and he absolutely loves it. So no. that's something that maybe people don't think of as much these days. It's not as like hot of a job, but also very relevant and you can pivot out of that. I think mm-hmm. again, just like doing something that's like broad and opportunistic is is kind of the approach I would take. And if all else fails, you can always apply to business school yeah. and reset after a couple of years. <laughs> 
which actually brings up a really good question. And we did a little piece on this. I don't know if you saw, I shared it with our LinkedIn post, basically breaking into PE, not really having the PE background per se, or the call it traditional finance background. Do you find that most individuals will go to business school to get into banking? Have there been a few stories and interactions amongst your peers breaking into PE and getting internships, maybe not even coming from traditional finance, maybe operating? Yeah, I do know that it happens. I think it's like, I'm not going to lie. It's definitely harder because um, um, these roles are still very competitive and most firms will probably try to hire at the VP level or senior associate level. So it is harder to break into to private equity if you have like no investing experience. But I know of a couple of people in my class that came from like business development or operating roles or tech roles and they were able to. I think it just goes it goes back to like leveraging your your strengths, right? Like if, if you worked in healthcare before, for example, like I have a friend who's an MD MBA and he worked at a big private equity for a firm this summer on their healthcare team because they were looking for that same skill set. And I think like with tech, you can also do the same thing. So just whatever your background is, learning how to use that to your favor rather than having it be like a weak point. Yeah, I think it comes down to a lot of that positioning of the story, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Nice. Did you have any questions for us on the office hour side of things? Anything of the sort before we kind of like get into a couple wrapping up moments? Yeah, I mean, how are you guys? Do you guys think this downturn or uh, like hiring issue that you spoke of? Do you think this is like a short term thing? Or how do you view this panning out in the next like 12, 18, 24 months? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And in all honesty, we've been doing some headhunting as well on the side of a lot of the interview prep, a lot of the coaching. And I think what's interesting there is that some mandates from specific firms that of course have been dealing with higher like basically interest charges, interest rate expenses, and affiliated with doing deals and are going back and retrading, they have actually basically let us know that like this is we're going into a downturn and a lot of what we read honestly says the same thing like going into 2023 arguably being worse than 2022 so it's kind of like maintain whatever you can get or maintain whatever you had from before mm -hmm. individuals that were at goldman looking into more opportunistic opportunities and now they're like you know what like i might just be fine with my goldman paycheck i'm just gonna ride this out for a little bit so as unfortunate as it is we actually advise a lot of people if you're going to be looking into opportunities and you're thinking about it in 2023 start doing that now with whatever happens with bonuses, which are expected to be pretty darn low, if not like borderline non-existent in 2023, think about it from the perspective of like, if you're looking to move, if you're looking to lateral, if you're looking to lock up a buy side role, 2023 start or 2024, might as well start doing that in advance. I'm always a little bit scared and hesitant of a firm hiring, take a discussion if they have like an associate class of like eight or 10 and they're going into 2023 or the next year. And they're like, you know what? Like, well, we have to show that we're cutting costs somewhere. So that eight to 10 dwindles down, dwindles down to like six or eight and they're still hiring. It's not like they aren't, but you might as well go when it's more kind of that, like, even if it's a tail end of a bull market, theoretically, where more people are being hired right now. And there still is that forecast like, yeah, we need 10 people. We can afford them. We have a big enough fund. Later, they're like, you know what? Like, could we just get away with like eight or six? And at its core, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, do seniors care as much about like, not so much like how much workload there is for juniors? But the reality is it's not like they're going to scrap juniors. I'm never going to say that. Yeah. Funds have a dedicated amount of money. CDNR raised money recently. Things like a $10 billion fund. Genstar recently raised. TPG, Asia, maybe. A variety of like uh, different funds, right? That are still being raised. They have to spend the money. They're not going to get rid of juniors by any means. But will they dwindle down a little bit? I think that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to affect our 2023 hiring process as a whole. I think at the same time, honestly, technically, if firms will be hiring less if layoffs will be happening arguably anyone going for roles will need to be even more prepared yeah before if it was like and honestly this had happened or has happened so we had mentees that were getting like four offers <laughs> like literally like three four i think even one time it was like close to five for either lateral or buy side because the market was so hot people really wanted like de and i candidates and they still do but at the same time it was like okay i've got a couple lateral i've got a couple buy side opportunities what do i choose now if it dwindles down to like one or two all of a sudden there will be people looking for roles and and that means you arguably have to be even more experienced and experienced and prepared 
tired going in. So I think that actually will lead to us being arguably busier. But at the same time, like we probably won't be able to keep up with all the demand. So it's going to be like, uh, we're going to specifically, specifically focus on like a group of individuals because if there aren't enough opportunities out there, we're not going to necessarily like also just like take on people to work with them to pursue a limited amount. I rather do better with fewer rather than work and have a diluted experience for many. Yeah, no, that that makes total sense. And I actually don't think private equity is going to get hit nearly as hard as maybe banking would, especially for firms that have been conservative in terms of how they invest their capital and they can go through like a couple harder years. Downturns generally represent opportunities. So I wouldn't think hiring would really decline too much at the PE level, at least, at least as, as, as you said, especially associates, right? No one's going to, I don't think people are going to be firing associates, uh, knock on wood. Yeah. There was a newsletter by one of our uh, headhunting friends where she said that riffs are just starting for banks, in all honesty. And even some private equity firms are laying off like analysts and associates. I, I think it might have been honestly, maybe like smaller firms that are really, really cognizant of headcount. But yes, I mean, all said and done, correct me if I'm wrong, Leona, because of course, well, I guess neither of us really saw like the 08 downturn. But a lot of my friends on the buy side are like, listen, like when the world goes down, like I'm excited because we're going to start buying things. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. That's the consensus I've seen as well. And I think, again, like if a firm's been like smart about how they allocate their capital and they haven't been bidding 30 times on like every tech deal in the world, then, then they're probably going to be okay. There's also like industries that will sustain these sorts of markets better than others. So totally agree that some firms, those who have probably been more aggressive on the leverage front or on the multiples they were paying for deals front, they're going to struggle in the next couple of years. But being conservative firms that have been careful are actually going to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. 100%. It's actually a really good question that I didn't, I think I almost like bypassed the Carlisle experience a little bit, my bad. But can you discuss the private credit, private capital positions in the current economy of rising rates? What are the pros and cons for career growth in relation to IB roles? Private credit, private capital. And we'll start yeah. Carlisle too, of course, kind of today. Yeah. So the team that I worked on at Carlisle was, it was an opportunistic credit team. So it wasn't direct lending. It was more so, special situations where a generally founder-led business couldn't access the debt markets because of something in their capital structure and they didn't want to give up equity. So we would develop these like very bespoke structured solutions for them. And I think in general, in the last couple of years, there's been tremendous demand for like special situations credit, private credit. What was interesting is I joined in the end of 2020 and I thought distressed would have been booming after the pandemic, but it wasn't at all because every industry was getting bailed out by the government essentially, or, you know, people were getting furloughed. So there was always really capital going into these industries. You weren't seeing a lot in the distress space, but I think now with like inflation where it's at and a lot of those like pandemic relief programs not being around anymore, you're probably going to see an uptick in, in distressed as well. But all in all, I think a lot of those strategies are really compelling. Some of them, my team only did credit, but like I think Apollo's hybrid value, for example, or Blackstone's uh, attack ops, they, they're a hybrid approach and, and you can be opportunistic in either market. So I think that's a great opportunity for people to pursue if they're considering next steps. Mm -hmm. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Honestly, it's kind of exactly what you mentioned, right? If we're going into a downturn and you can actually see this on our job board, I think the first thing that popped up was a restructuring role. So if restructuring roles are hiring, go down that route, right? And just kind of like go where opportunity is knocking, right? After some time and then figure it out along the way, right? I mean, that's like, honestly, you know, that's like really refreshing to have that conversation around like figuring out what you want step by step. But of course, having that, having that thought process around, like, I'm not just like bouncing around here, right? I'm doing a lot of thoughtful diligence to get an understanding of what I like, what I don't like, why through experience. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's like you said, there shouldn't be a lot of pressure about figuring everything out toward the beginning of your yeah. career. The world we live in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I totally understand that there is like, I felt like there was as well a couple of years ago and, and still sometimes do. It's, it's natural, but I think the finance world has become more flexible. It's no longer like you have to do this and this in order to get into private equity or hedge fund or whatever you want to do. And I think that's of like great benefit to everyone. Bring up a good point. Have you, did you evaluate public equity and kind of that more like silo dynamic versus team dynamic and PE? So I very briefly 
flirted with it at the beginning of last year when I was doing internship recruiting and only because it was something I'd never tried out. And like I said, my brother works in public markets and he loves it. So Mm -hmm. I thought like maybe I should explore it, but very quickly realized that it wasn't a good fit for me. Like a lot of things I really like about private equity, like getting very deep into the details of like management teams or whatnot. Don't really get that in public markets. And also the biggest reason why I didn't actually pursue it in terms of interviewing was because the preparation is so vastly different. And well, I think it's important to have like a broad net. You don't want to interview for like four industries that require completely different prep because then you'll just, you know, yeah. spread yourself way too thin. So I, I ultimately just went for PE. Yeah. You confuse yourself. You confuse, I'm sure, like the listener. And then after some time, it's like, what exactly are we trying to do here? I know some people from your, I think from your class, probably the class power, I'm sure it happens every year that go to like an Elliot that try something different for like a summer and then they choose effectively. This is what they're looking to do or it's not right and go back directly to PE because public ends up being like pretty siloed. You think individually, almost like an individual contributor versus like when you're in private equity, it's much more like team driven. From what I've learned, it's like, okay, public equity, it's like you have all of this information now you have to sift through it. Private equity, you're digging for info versus of course, just having access to all this info. And after some time, it's like, well, I think that's why like some of the shows and some kind of like the glamorized approach is just like trying to find alpha, right? And trying to do what you can. Whereas like in private equity, it's like, listen, like we know what we know, right? And what this company has given us. And sure, we can like drill into it a little bit further. But after some time, it's like, listen, like what our team comes back with, like, this is what it is. Yeah, exactly. And and also just kind of like the day to day of the job. It's it's like that operational element that we spoke about, even if you're at a PE firm, that's not super operational. If you're a control investor, you're still responsible for driving like this strategy, you're still working yeah. closely with management, and you don't get that in public market. So I think it's important to think about like whether or not you find that interesting. Yeah, makes sense. Awesome. And I guess we just have a couple minutes left. Any other questions, feel free to let me know. And then we could do like a quick little round around or quick little rapid fire. Leona, what would be the advice you would give to Leona 10 years younger? 10 years younger. Gosh, I would just tell myself to believe in myself more, you know, <laughs> like I think so many people try to hedge themselves a million ways. So just yeah, go after what you want. Nice. Something you believe in that most people don't necessarily believe in. It's a slightly tougher one. Career wise? Wise, thought process wise, industry wise. I would just say like passion is probably the most important thing and drives success. Mm-hmm. Awesome. News articles or call it like news pieces, books, periodicals, podcasts, favorites? Yeah, I mean, I read like all the normal ones. So like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, so those subscriptions. There's a couple like health ones that I read. I listen to the Kaiser family, like what the health podcast is really, right. really good. And yeah, I think that's probably it. Subscribe to a bunch of HBS stuff, which sends me news. Yeah, <laughs> nice. New York or London? Well, I have to say New York now because I'm moving there. <laughs> but okay. both. Both. Nice. That's awesome. Are you excited for your uh, your next role coming up? Yeah, I'm super excited. I had a great summer. And yeah, I think I got lucky in that like the team was fantastic. It just worked out really well. Love. That's awesome. And I figured you'd uh, say something like that, which makes sense. But that's good. And then as a second year undergrad, I guess like last major question here, if you're looking to break into IB, but have a fixed income trading internship opportunity at a bulge bracket, should you take it or hold out? I guess that comes down to the question around like, how do you know when what you have is kind of like your best, right? And we're kind of in that environment of always like wanting more. Yeah, that's such a hard one. Cause I, like I said, I think it's so important to believe in yourself and go after what you want. Cause you're always going to wonder what if, right? And I still like regret not going after or like New York coming out of college really? going after Houston I don't regret it but if there's like one thing I wish I had done differently it would have been just uh-huh. having had like more faith in myself mm-hmm. so yeah I think when you're young you're not going to make a ton of mistakes so go after what your heart really desires but like with that said also be smart about like again the environment that we're in and if you've been interviewing for nine months and haven't gotten any other roles then maybe take that role but if it's the very beginning of your start go after what you want to do love it and then no, that makes total sense. And mentors, I guess this is like the final, final question. Mentors, people that you really credit, of course, kind of like your thought process, success, and just in general, kind of like helping you out along the way. Yeah, I mean, I've been super lucky in that I've had a lot of really great mentors in my life. And I think those people have, have actually changed depending on where I was in my career. You know, in college, I was like, I did a lot of startup stuff. So there were some people nice. through the entrepreneurship world that like really mentored me and like gave me confidence to, to go after the things I wanted uh, when I was in 
London. My bosses were like fantastic and mm -hmm. helped me do the types of deals I wanted to do. They wrote my HBS recommendations, mentored me oh. in that sense. And then, yeah, yeah my parents have, have been there the entire time. So they I would be it. the ultimate mentors. Nice. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. We obviously wish you the best of luck in the new role upcoming, of course, with school as a whole, but in all honesty. So the articles have helped out quite a bit. Many individuals that we've like sent them on towards have been like, wow, like this was like a last minute read kind of like that, like PE preparation in 48 hours, how to think about like knowing stuff as an analyst, not knowing stuff as an analyst, but in all honesty, hope that you're open to, of course, a little bit of coaching too, as we get into it. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to help. And thank you so much for having me. Of course. And uh, time flew by. So hope you have a good one. All right. You too. Bye. Take care.